All right, well, thank you very much, Gabe, for the introduction and the very warm welcome here. <laughs> um, and welcome, everyone, to Austin. This is my hometown, so I'm really excited that I didn't have to fly anywhere <laughs> for this conference. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about multi-architectural things today. We're both from IBM. Uh, we both work in the systems group, so we work on the Docker team in the systems group, which is really um, more hardware focused. So there's also a Docker team in our cloud group, but they don't ever have to deal with systems, and we're trying to make them deal with power and Z, but it's not quite, it's not quite happened yet. So, um, so that's why we're going to talk about different architectures, because that's kind of what we try to make work and also just make Docker better in general and submit, you know, fun things upstream. So um, the LTC is the Linux group we work in is kind of just an all over the place group at IBM that's been doing Linux for almost 20 years. So it's a really cool place to work inside of IBM because it's still a bunch of like hacky rebel people who, you know, don't want to really actually, like, drink all the blue Kool-Aid. <laughs> but, uh, so um, it's a lot of fun. Um, and I've been at IBM for a very long time, so I've drank a lot of blue Kool-Aid at this point in my life. But <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I'm Chris, and I'm the very opposite end of the spectrum. I've uh, been in the LTC and IBM in general for uh, a year and a half. Uh, I'm also based out of Austin, but I'm not from here. So if you have any Austin questions, don't ask me. Ask her, because that's basically what I do. Except uh, he doesn't listen to my advice, so. This is also true. Um, some of you may know me by my GitHub handle. It's tofj slash IBM. And you probably read that and, and are very confused. Um, but that's who I am. I do some like upstream Docker stuff every now and then. If you submitted a multi-architecture PR in the past year or so, I've probably looked at it. Um, and yeah. Yeah, so also I wanted to mention that if you were listening to the keynote this morning and Ben Golub got up on stage and said, we like to say we do ARM to Z, I was like, um, hey, that's in our talk, but that we're not talking about Docker Data Center and all of that stuff with the IBM platforms in our talk. So if you have questions about that, I can answer them later. <laughs> but that was a really sort of surprising coincidence that he said that in the, the thing this morning. So. Just wanted to get that out of the way. But now we'll talk about our actual multi-arch presentation. Um, so first we'll talk about what is multi-architecture? What are we talking about? It's not the Docker Data Center stuff or the enterprise um, thing that Ben mentioned this morning. Um, then we'll go through some examples of like how you can do it, why we think it's important, and hopefully you will think it's important by the end of this talk. Um, I'll also go through a Docker manifest command that I have submitted upstream to Docker right now. And it was, that's a long story, but anyway. Um, and then we'll do the demo at the end with the swarm um, and lots of different architectures in one swarm. Okay, so another quick thing. Uh, you did say this was like really heavy demo focused. Oh. <laughs> uh, we do do a demo at the end, uh, but the next like 20 minutes or so are slides, so just keep that in mind. Definitely pay attention. Don't get me wrong, but uh, it's not going to be like super heavy demo stuff. Uh, so anyway, first off, what in the, it's fine. <laughs> so first off, what in the world are we talking about? Uh, what is this multi-arch thing? What do we mean in the context of our talk? Uh, so in the context of our talk, uh, when we mention multi-architecture, what we mean is running Docker on a variety of different platforms and devices, all that have different underlying architectures. Um, so you can kind of see, <laughs> There's a bunch of containers on the right, and uh, actually not all of them are supported in Docker, but most of them are. Uh, ARM HF, that's the 32-bit ARM. Um, ARCH 64, ARM 64, PowerPC 64 LE, woo! Uh, S390X, that's the Z server. X86, which is probably what all of you are running. Uh, these are all things that are in Docker right now. Um, and I'm going to take another note here. Uh, Docker is also supported on different operating systems. So this talk is going to be primarily focused about Linux, but if you, it, it's also supported on FreeBSD and, um, what is it, something called Windows? Yeah. <laughs> but, but we don't know anything about that, so just don't ask us questions about that. Sorry, sorry. Uh, and anyway, back to multi-arch. So our main goal for this is, <laughs> Thumbs up. Uh, our main goal for this is that the user experience across all architectures and devices is the same. So if you're running Docker on, let's say, an x86 server farm, it's going to be the same as if you have this Raspberry Pi teapot in your kitchen. So, so um, how many of you are running x86? Probably literally everybody. <laughs> uh, how many of you are running ARM? Okay, I'm going to ask that question one more time. How many, how many of you are running ARM? <laughs> 
Okay, that's mm -hmm. that's a little better. Uh, do we have any power people in the audience? Yes, a few. Two. Yes, I love you all. Uh, any <laughs> Z people? Oh, uh, I see your giant sticker. And that, yes. Yeah, an ARM 64. I'll, I'll include both arms, but uh, yeah, okay, that's great. So most of you, by large, are x86 people, so you might be thinking, why necessarily do I care about ARM and Z and, you know, expanding my projects so that it includes all of these things? Um, so first, let's, uh, let's take an example project. In this case, we'll, we'll pick at Docker. Um, because we're here. <laughs> uh, and let's, let's take a look at uh, a regular Docker user, an experienced Docker user who is using multi-architecture for the first time. So let's say this guy just bought an S390X mainframe off of Craigslist um, and he just wanted to do a Docker run Ubuntu for the first time. So what will happen? Uh, you know, Docker run Ubuntu, that should return a shell, right? Uh, but instead, it returns this exec user process error. So right off the bat, this guy is just Oh man, multi-architecture, just not working. Docker project, you know, ugh, your usability. Uh, so he's a little bit frustrated. Uh, after doing a little bit of digging around into GitHub issues, he finds that the correct way to do this on a multi-architecture platform is to point your Docker onto a architecture-specific image. So in this case, it's S390X slash Ubuntu, so he does a Docker run of that, and it works perfectly. Oh no. No. I think my clicker is <laughs> doing two clicks at once. I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, so next up, he decides to put the mainframe away for a little while, take out his um, ARCH64 Raspberry Pi because he's really cool like that, uh, and does a Docker run of RethinkDB. Uh, so right away, he encounters the same error as before, and he's thinking, oh man, okay, I know how to solve this one. If I point my Docker run to an ARCH64 RethinkDB, it should work, right? Wrong. He encounters another error. And in, in this case, the error is caused because RethinkDB doesn't actually, it hasn't been ported over to the platform that he's on. Anyway, how do you think this user is feeling about multi-architecture in this project right now? <sighs> it's so long, it's so satisfying. <laughs> so, okay, let's take a step back and look at what went wrong here. So the biggest issue here was that the user had to think and remember that he was using Docker on another platform. And like Solomon said yesterday, like you never want your users to have to think about, well, literally anything. So when he does a Docker run, in the first case, he has to now remember, okay, what platform am I on? What Docker run? What image am I pointing it at? Am I pointing it at an S390X, x86, whatever? Uh, in the case, uh, in the second case, he also has to think, okay, does this image actually exist on the platform that I'm on? And both of these things together greatly harm usability in your project. So okay, bad stuff aside, uh, what are some benefits that for you to you know, multi-architecture your project? Uh, so on the right over there, you can see uh, this very professional drawn image uh, that we like to call the circle of open source. <laughs> and very, very simply it says, uh, the more useful your project is, the more visible it'll, it'll be. And the more visible your project is, the more contributions you'll get. The more contributions you'll get, the more useful your project is. Last part is kind of a hopefully. hopefully. But anyway, uh, all of these things together basically say, okay, the more of any of that area that you have, the more you can grow your project. So in the case of Docker, for instance, once they sort of opened up Docker for the ARM folks and us power folks and some Z folks, we all sort of came in and started doing contributions. And in addition to, you know, hopefully the Docker getting a little bit better, we, we hope our contributions are good. Um, there are other benefits to it as well. So the ARM folks, because they're so used to you know, low power devices, uh, they get to add in a lot of code for optimizations like that. While the Z folks, on the other hand, are used to running you know, thousands of containers on one node, so their code contributions go towards things like that. So all these things could be benefits in your project. So now that Chris has both extolled the virtues of multi-arch um, putting that in your project and also sort of pointed out some pain points that maybe users are having that you don't know that you're inflicting on people if you have projects. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how you can think about multi-architecture for your projects. And we'll start with this clicker. I don't know, new batteries. Um, how to build binaries for other architectures on your native system. So if you're going to build a binary, what are the ways you can do that? So obviously you can use the actual hardware. You can be like that guy who found a 
random mainframe on Craigslist and really bought it and assembled it. <laughs> I don't know if it really worked, but it happened. Um, so you can use the actual hardware. You can do hardware-assisted virtualization. I'm sure everyone out there is familiar with KVM or Zen or whatever sort of flavor of virtualization that you are, your favorite one is. Um, or you can do full system emulation using QME if you want. So you can actually configure a, like a power PC 64LE virtual machine on top of an x86 box, which is a whole lot of overhead and probably not what you want to do just to build a binary. Um, or you can do something called user mode emulation, which QMU will also let you do and is really cool. And you can do that and build binaries. Or cross-compiling, which is, has the cross-compiling support has gotten a lot better in compilers over the past, I would say, 10 or so years. So that's also a pretty basic, um, easier to do option. So I'll go through the last two as examples. So bin format MISC is one that I was not familiar with a couple of years ago, but have started looking into, and it's actually pretty easy to use and kind of cool. So I'll talk about that for anybody who's not familiar with what it is. So the name starts with bin, so bin binary, so bin format MISC. So what is it? It actually is a tool that's in your operating system that will let you run non-native binaries just straight on your system. So it's the user mode emulation. So it actually looks at some information in your binary and then figures out which interpreter needs to be used and just tells your operating system, like, hey, use this one, and then it translates it, and then you can run it straight on your system. So, and it's also pre-configured in Docker for Mac, which is how I really got into poking around with it, because I was like, well, I mean, why isn't that there for power? And it turns out it is there also for power, but originally the stuff told you that it was there for ARM, so it sort of turned out to this really cool bunch of stuff in Docker for Mac, so um, you can follow along. So I've been racking my brain trying to sort of like find a more accessible way to explain this sort of nerdy thing that you can do and build other um, systems binary. So in Office Space, in the imaginary world of Inditech, there is Milton, but in the very real world, we're gonna say that there's this guy whose name is Ben F. Misk. And so the analogy that I think works here is that you can think of the bin format MISC as sort of its only job is, let's say that Ben F. MISC has a Rolodex, pretty much. And he has his Rolodex that is just information that will point you to the right interpreter to use. And so you can think of bin format MISC that way, as like, this guy, that's his only job, is to go, oh, flip, 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 here's the interpreter that you need. And then you're good to go. So then your job as the user is to actually populate his Rolodex for him and make sure that all of those interpreters are there. So these next two slides are just some quick instructions for how you can do that. If you want to play with this on your Linux system and you don't have Docker for Mac because you're not cool like me and you run Fedora and you don't have all of this set up already for you. Um, so <laughs> um, yeah, so you, there's actually a surprise, surprise, a Docker um, image out there that will populate this Rolodex for you. So you just do this docker run command from this multi-arch project, which is a bunch of really cool stuff you guys should definitely check out later. Go to the multi-arch GitHub and poke around and find some fun things that you can use. So you can run this docker um, command and it will actually, you know, populate the Rolodex. So it'll put all of these files down in this bin format mist directory for you. And those are the things that have all of the information that will say like, you know, if you have this binary, this is the information that I'm gonna look for in it, and then here's the interpreter that is actually gonna translate things for your operating system to use. So then after you've got your Rolodex populated, you need to make sure that you have the actual emulator living on your system. And um, there is also the Multi-Arch Project. Those guys built all of these um, statically compiled um, QMU binaries for you to go and download and use and build and run things with. So this is just a curl of one of them and then you unzip it into your user bin QMU directory and you have at least one of the things that this Rolodex is going to point to. And so now that you have those two things done, if you're on your x86 VM like we did in this example, you can actually run a power. So this is a Docker run and then you can see the image name is a PowerPC64. <coughs> Um, busy box image. And so you can actually run that natively on your x86 laptop. And um, the only thing to note is that you need to do the, the bind mount in of the emulator into the container in order to do these. 
but you don't have to on Dogger for Mac because they're so much cooler than my, my system. Um. <laughs> or, or you're running Docker for Mac, uh, like she was saying, and all of this is already built in. Uh, so all you need to do is point your Docker run to an architecture specific image. In this case, we have PowerPC 64LE slash BusyBox. Just do a Docker run of that and yeah, that just works. So, okay. Uh, we're going to take a moment to talk about uh, this kind of complex thing called cross compiling in Go. Uh, and essentially what cross compiling is, is I'm on one architecture and I want to compile some binaries for another one. Um, so, in Go, this looks something like this. So you point the target operating system, in this case it's Linux, then you point out the target architecture, in this case it's ARM, you point it to your project, you do a Go build, and yeah, that's kind of it. That's kind of it. That just works. I'm going to do a quick check. Okay. I was like, We're good. We're just good. kidding. Just ignore that. <laughs> okay. So... We've showed you how you can build binaries and, you know, told you why we think that it's important. And now I know everybody is thinking, like, how can I, you know, broaden my project and make everyone's lives happier? Um, so just a little bit of advice on if you're, you know, going to run out and start doing this in your project or if you're going to start a project. Like, some things we've some, seen done well and some things that have also been sort of painful for us as another architecture coming into other projects that we want to use. So first of all, if you're putting together a project or you want to go back and sort of like restructure yours a little bit, some things that have worked really well for people are not hard coding things in, and this sounds obvious now at this point in time, but like not hard coding things in to your build files, um, your Docker files, your you know, make files, all of the things that you have that actually sort of like are the scaffolding of your project and not your code you can make sure that you parameterize a lot of that stuff, like repository names, all have the slash, you know, whatever. So a lot of times you go to build something and like you think you've got the code all done, but then it pulls from the x86 repository and you can't. So <laughs> you can literally parameterize almost well, everything. Um, and this is just an example of the Docker project, like all of the Docker files that you can build Docker on um, originally, there was just this one Docker file, so it doesn't have an extension, but you know, you're welcome to put whatever extension you want for your uh, x86 or ARM Docker file. Um, so, yeah, and then, you know, when you do your Docker run, there's that minus F flag that you can put in there instead of just assuming that there's only going to be the one. So that's, you know, sort of a, an easy thing to think about when you're, you know, redoing your projects, because you're all going to go redo your projects now. Um, and then on the sort of sad end, like some things that have been painful is projects that have been very optimized for the thing processor that whoever made this project was using. And so, you know, we come along and are like, oh, we would like to also use this. And so we're going to maybe expect to come in and have to tweak a couple of little things to get it running. And then it turns out you get into this, this compile, fa compile failure and there's like directories full of... Um, I never can ever remember the word assembly. I assembly. have a computer science degree, but that word just goes out of my brain. So assembly, like you'll find just mass amounts of it and not really any documentation about what it's doing. And so that is kind of a bummer when you're coming in from another architecture. So ways that you can think about that, like, you know, by all means optimize your code, but you can also put in maybe some slow paths in there somewhere for other code or, you know, at least a stubbed out file and like, you know, this will not work if you're not on x86, but here's what it should do. Some stuff like that. And so some ways you can do that are, you know, if Defs in C and Go has these really cool things called build constraints and some people call them build tags. So this is just an example of um, other, again, some Docker code, a zfs.go file and a zfs unsupported.go file. And the build constraints look like this. They're just a comment at the top with a plus build and then the actual constraint names. And so Go has some built-in ones. So this one pretty much says like, compile this file if we're building on Linux or FreeBSD or Solaris. And then you're gonna compile this one if you're, on free, if you're not on Linux and not FreeBSD and not Solaris. So the spaces are ORs and the commas are ANDs. So there's some syntax there. But anyway, that's just an example of if you want to optimize or you know do something really specific, like how to sort of get around it and maybe prepare for other things that 
aren't going to be using the stuff that you might use. So since we're at DockerCon, where does Docker fit into this sort of stuff? Um, just first, we'll step back and do a little bit of history of like this multi-art stuff. It's not a new problem. It's not a, something that is newly brought to Docker's attention or Docker's users have just suddenly been like, oh, this is something we should fix. Actually, it's been um, you know, a thing that's been worked on for a long time. So multi-art support was added to the registry over a year ago. So there's been support there for a long time. And then there's also been this project called the Scopio Project, which was, I think, initially started by someone named Antonio Bernaca, who I've never met, but uh, obviously a pretty smart guy. He has this whole, whole project that was then absorbed into uh, Project Atomic. And then Phil Estes, who is here, back there in the corner, standing up very tall, has a, a tool that a whole lot of people, present company included, use um, in production. and push their images so they'll create multi-architectural images and push those to Docker Hub using Phil's tool. And I would also like to say that Phil used to be in the LTC with us, but he is now in the cloud group, so they get Phil's brain. Um, so we've gone from the Scopio project and now this tool that you can use to do multi-arch images to the pull request that I have in Docker Hub right now that does um, the next evolution of multi-arch things so that you can, you know, once you build your multi-arch images, you can make users' lives easier by pushing them up to the registry. So a little bit of another step back is what is manifest in this Docker manifest command. So pretty much if you stick with uh, Docker's sort of like seafaring theme, you can think of um, a manifest as sort of like a ship's manifest, like there's the ship and then there's the list of all of the things that are in the ship. So you can think of an image as having a manifest. It's just a list of all of the things that are actually in your image. So you've got the layers, the architecture that it was built for, the operating system that it was built for, and some other sort of metadata. And then the next extension of that that's going to allow you to do the multi-architectural stuff is the manifest list. And so that's just pretty much a thing that looks like an image name, but it's actually a manifest list, and it points to different images. So if you want to do the stuff that Chris was showing in the earlier example and just like Docker run this one thing, then your Docker engine will actually look at what's in this manifest list and figure out which one it needs to pull down from the registry, and you don't have to say, oh, hey, user, actually, if you want this one, then you need this architecture image, and it's here, and like they might not be in the same place. So you can use a manifest list and make it a lot easier. So the docker manifest command takes advantage of those things. And it actually will let you do a shallow pull of an image so you can get just the manifest information. So right now, if you want to look at just information, you have to pull the image down first, and then you can do a docker inspect on it. So the manifest will let you, the command will let you just look at that information. Or you can also do what Phil's tool will let you do now, and you can make a manifest list locally and push it up to the registry using the docker tools. So this is just going to be two examples of using it, either interactively or using a YAML file. So this one real fast is the create command that you do first to make this image name, which is the manifest actually, the manifest list name, and then which images are going to be pointed to by it. So there's the BusyBox one for x86, the Arch64 BusyBox one, the ArmHF one, the Power one, and the mainframe one. So when we're making this one, we're making a manifest list that actually points to all of those things under the covers. And then you can do something called annotate it. And you can actually specify more information like some CPU features or other things that are supported by this particular image. And in this case, we're pretty much annotating only the ARM one because there are so many ARM things. If any of you, are, a few of you are out there in ARM land and maybe have run into, if you've ever used the multi-arch one, maybe. There, this is probably definitely something you should do, just as a tip, if you're going to do the annotation, or you're going to do manifest lists, just go ahead and do that for your 32-bit arms. But anyway, um, sidetrack. So then after you've done the annotations, you actually will use this command and push it up to the registry. And then you can tell your users, hey, here's your BusyBox image, and that's it. That's the only one you'll ever have to tell them about ever again, and all of that confusion will go away, and it will be glorious. Or if you don't want to do all of those commands every time and annotate every single image and push it up, 
You can just put it all in the YAML file and just one time do a command. So for those of you who have build systems and you're going to build an image for every architecture, just plop it on a file, do the thing, you'll be good to go. And then the last few things I wanted to mention with the manifest command is that you can inspect either the manifest list, so the one we just made and pushed up to the registry, you can pull that info down and look at it. What is in this manifest list? Does it have what I want? Um, and then also you can inspect just an image name if you want to just see sort of what is in this image and it is it what I want. Okay, so let's take everything that Christy just said, uh, let's put it together and see what we can do. So first, we're going to create a multi-architecture image. In this case, uh, and I'll show it on the terminal in a second, but in this case, uh, we're going to call it just tofj slash dockercon. And it's going to have four images that it's going to be pointing at. It's going to have a power image, an x86 image, an arm image, and an S390X image. Next, we're going to take that and we are going to put it into a Docker Swarm. Uh, the Docker Swarm is going to contain, you know, an x86 machine, an ARM machine, uh, a mainframe, and a power machine. And in our example, we have an underneath an Nginx load balancer, but don't worry about that right now. So, jumping to demos, let's see. Ah, I actually want to end the slide first. Okay, all right. So. Right now, I am just in a directory with a bunch of Docker files. Uh, there's a power one, an x86 one, an arm one, and a z one. Let's just take a look at the x86 one for a second. So it, it looks like a, just a normal Docker file, and all of these are just normal Docker files. Uh, it's just got a from Ubuntu line. Uh, it, this one is pretty simple. It just installs Go, exposes a port, um, builds a Go server, and then just displays an image. Uh, if we look at an arm one, for instance, It'll look exactly the same, except the from line is different, and actually the image that the server will be displaying is different too, but don't worry about that right now. Uh, so I've pushed all these images already, so let's actually make a manifest list, this multi-architecture image, uh, from all of this. So to do that, I do a docker manifest create. We'll call it tofj slash dockercon, hopefully, there we go. Um, and then I'll point it to all of my constituent images. So x86, 64. Do -do. The power one. The Z one. And the arm one. And hopefully I didn't make any typos. Yep. Okay. So we now have our sort of like local manifest. So let's actually annotate it too. Um, we're going to set uh, the architecture for ARM to be ARM instead of ARMHF. So docker manifest annotate, and then we're going to point it at our manifest that we just created, so tofj slash dockercon. Uh, then we're going to point it at our specific image, so tofj slash ARMHF. We are going to set the OS to Linux and the Arch to ARM. Huh? Docker. tofj slash ARMHF. Ah, yes, thank you. Yes, if I make a mistake, please tell me. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so now that's all good and annotated. So now we can just do a Docker manifest push. And this will eventually push. Uh, Pushing is fun. Uh, this is where the demo gods don't, don't agree with us. I mean, oh. there we go. Successfully pushed manifest <laughs> list. We did it. We did it, everyone. Okay. So on this machine, uh, you can see on the right all of my worker nodes. Uh, so the one on the left is an ARM one, and then we have a Z one, and then uh, let's see, Ubuntu slash zero one is actually a power one that we forgot to change the host name on, and then uh, <laughs> whoops, <laughs> and then we have an x86 one. So if we do a Docker node ls, uh, we can see all of them are here and ready. So uh, let's go ahead and create a service using this uh, one image that we just created, this one manifest list. Uh, so Docker service creates, we'll call it DockerCon2. Um, just open up some ports. Set the mode to global so it runs on all of them. And then point it to our tofj slash DockerCon. And cross our fingers and 
All right, it is now running on all of those. Ooh, you see all the green ones on the right. Um, okay, so this will eventually load once our load balancer likes us and the servers is officially started, which does take a couple of seconds. Um, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, we can also inspect the service over here. Just to see that it's actually, that one manifest list is now running on all of these. And we didn't have to create like any sort of node constraints for these, anything like that. So it was actually pretty simple. This is probably not that realistic. I'm sure nobody's gonna run the same thing on their mainframe that they're running on their Raspberry Pi, but just for illustrative purposes. But now we know that we <laughs> <You> can. can. <laughs> Okay, so on the right here, uh, it's actually a gopher, it's a gopher con of me. Uh, it's a gopher I made from gopherize.me. Uh, in this case, it's running on the ARM machine. So uh, load balancer, please like us. I'm gonna refresh it again. <laughs> okay, wow. Yeah. And then we get, <laughs> uh, this one is of Christy and it's running on the power machine. And you all can actually open this up and you will hopefully one, not crash my machine and two, get a different gopher. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I think that was it. As far as slides, there's a resources slide and there was a small disclaimer about Raspberry Pi being a registered trademark because we put a teeny tiny picture of in there and I don't want to get sued because lawyers. So <laughs> I work yes. at a, a giant corporation and the lawyers have instilled the fear of all kinds of things in me. So that's there. <laughs> But that's it. That's all we've got. Um, we've got a couple of minutes for questions, I think. Thank you, Chris and Christy. If there are any questions, please would you be so kind to line up here that oh. I can hand out a mic and we have your question on, on, on the video. So that was really cool, very smooth. The from is still a wart. Are we going to be able to move past architecture specific froms because yes, all my Docker files these. are the same except for that? No, you can use the, that, I realized that when we put this together, like why didn't we make a multi-arch Ubuntu and do the from to that and that's definitely an oversight in our demo, but yeah, you can do that. So if you do a from to a multi-arch, it'll automatically use the manifest to get the right yep. one for what you're building for? Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, and then in this case, uh, like the swarm service is actually doing a Docker run of, and it's looking at that manifest list, and, which is being pointed to the correct Docker file. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the session. Very cool. It's nice to see non-cloud side of things, which is <laughs> actually much more <laughs> complicated than from architectural perspective. Um, a quick question: You mentioned there is a, it's a, uh, it's still not part of Docker yet. It's still there is a pull request. We have a pull request. Or Chrissy specifically. Yeah. Curious when it's gonna be merged or what are the plans? So if it you was know. this close, and then we're like, well, we should maybe refactor the backend and split it into more PRs, and then the Moby thing happened. So I need to. It's it's. I think it's almost in, but but I mean. The, the design won't change and the registry functionality won't change. So you can either use Phil's tool or you can use it if you really want to do multi-architectural images. The registry part is the most important part at this point. Okay. Uh, you will have slides available, I'm, I'm hoping. I, think I, I did, didn't catch all the detail. I think Docker put them on. Yes. Yeah, they're already there. Mm -hmm, thanks. Hi, I noticed a lot of uh, duplication in the Docker files between the architectures, and I'm wondering if you've thought about how to how to consolidate that, maybe support architecture in the Docker file directly so that you can just um, have conditionals or something rather than having duplicate Docker files with, with yeah. so much. I mean, so what some people do is like they'll pass it in as an arg, that you can already do args in Docker. Um, but in that case, we were kind of lazy and made our, or just to show that you can make separate Docker files, I'll say that was on purpose. But I mean, you can definitely do one Docker file for your whole project and do a multi-arch image at the top. And if there are no differences, you might not even have to put any args in with architectures. I mean, it's definitely something that's doable and pretty simple if you wanted to. Any other questions? Please give a hand again to Christy and Chris. Thanks, and don't forget, if you like the talk, don't forget to upload it in your DockerCon application. Thank you very much.